Thank you, Dr. Dare. With that, let me turn it over to the floor for questions. Please wait to be recognized, and a runner with the mic will be uh, with you. But we've heard from four fantastic panelists all talking about different dimensions of healthcare and how much opportunity there is. Uh, with that, uh, questions? Good morning, and uh, thank you for a great presentation. My name is Ramla Batra. I work for Scan Health Plan. I'm the Chief Medical Officer. And it's great to hear about uh, all the things that are innovative happening with data, especially as it pertains to healthcare. And I'm sure you've heard that, you know, in terms of adoption, healthcare is even below government in uh, adopting digital technology and things like that. So as a pair, we have data points on our population for many, many years. Our average duration is six, seven years. And we have all kinds of data points from people calling us to paying claims to medications to HRAs and everything else. For us, the real life thing to solve is how do we reduce cost of care and improve experience and deploy programs that make a difference. And it's interesting to note that as we are looking at it, we have a lot of homegrown programs. So as we are looking at technologies that's available, so Kansai models are the ones that we are working for there are really no out-of-box solutions that you can take and deploy and say, hey, is it going to help us in predicting correctly? In fact, when you work with these models, it feels like we are bringing more to the table than the technology that is available to do that. So it feels like we hear about all these progressive things, but in real life, when we are trying to solve real-life problems, we are still going back to older tools that we have homegrown. So where do we see that going in terms of risk predictions in terms of matching interventions, like simple things that how do I find out who is more likely to end up in the ER with ambulatory care sensitive admission? We are creating a tool from a scratch. You would think the industry, you know, as progressive as it is, would have solved it by now because to your point, Amazon knows what book I want to read next, but I don't know who's going to end up in the ER next. So I just wanted to hear from folks. Who wants to take that? Take it. As you're looking at me and... Uh... <laughs> Um, no, it's a, it's a reality check that I think there are very, very few plug-and-play um, models. And I, I always say, it's ironic, but I think AI in healthcare is going to take thousands, hundreds of thousands of people getting more knowledgeable with basics of data science. And, you know, most of the problems that you face in, on the payer side, on the provider side, can actually be very adequately solved or at least... Um, mitigated um, with just, you know, machine learning that you don't need a fancy model for. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the complexity of healthcare is, so we have a paradox here. We have things that we can do very easily with robotic process automation or machine learning. On the other hand, I appreciate how complex med biomedicine is. And it's kind of, it's not playing the game Go. It's more like playing real-time strategy game. You have multiple fronts changing all the time. So I think in the, in the first phase would be just use basic machine learning, robotic process automation to save money. And the money that you save, I think, is better to invest in more complicated models where you can actually um, do better, uh, even better data science. So it's, a, I think, a multi-phase uh, approach to these issues. I'd, I'd like to add to that, right? Uh, Anthony said something I think is truly um, important to remember. There are very few plug and play solutions out there. There's an investment that's required from organizations to ingest technologies, and, and I'm going to use the word platforms here because they're not just technologies, they're platforms, but then they have to be configured in a way that solve real business problems. So you can't just buy something and, and talk to your IT team and plug it in. There's an effort of really looking at the data sources, looking at the workflows, looking at what's being presented back to facilitate better decision making. It's not, you know, it's not plug and play. There's real work to implement these things. But I would say if you look at the investment portfolio that's going on out there around digital healthcare, there's tools out there that can start down that road, but they're not plug and play for you. And you're right. And so for us, you know, we have invested in the digital, te digital technology roadmap. And as a part of that roadmap, we're investing data and data insights. And so as you work with these solutions, like I'm taking the Kensai example, they are still trying to figure out what we are trying to look at. And we have a lot of different data points to share. So we have a, a, a viewpoint to bring to the table, but it's still not that easy. Like similarly, if you think about it, people who call us, we have 200,000 members. On an average, each one of them calls us once a year. So think about how many data points we have around text analytics, around can we predict dementia based on what they're saying? Can we predict who's going to be upset because they're not getting access? 
But you would think there are so many, healthcare is number one in terms of people's priority and it's, it's still not plug and play. I'm not getting to plug and play, but even understanding how do we design those models so we can meet the needs is still missing. But be, also just be careful between fact and hype. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of hype. Yes. And many of these organizations that say they've figured out some neural network to stratify your population and they have some significant black box for you, I would tell you, keep investing in what you're doing. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of two tools out there and one of them is from CMS mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the groupers. Mm -hmm. And then there's the DXCGs. Those are two very good ones, very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And you could tailor those and they are a little bit of plug and play. Mm -hmm. and continue down that road. I mean, this is an area that we've been trying to do it when the old days of disease management was mm -hmm. around, yeah. remember, and yeah, we're all course. trying to stratify. Listen, keep investing. You know your population. You know you have the data. If you could leverage what Anthony said, leverage as much machine learning to reduce the time, a little bit more intelligence, a little bit more around natural language processing to turn a lot of the written notes into just mm -hmm. you know more more usable data. I think you'll be fine. There's there's no panacea out there. Just also, I think in the last twelve months, I'm seeing more and more um, open source platforms yeah. for machine learning and now even deep learning. Mm -hmm. So I, I, and I'm working closely with a few medical school deans to introduce that into the curriculum. So I always think, you know, not just the uh, younger generation, but also um, older generation clinicians really need to understand the basics. And someone famously said that um, clinicians think medicine is a biological science with data, when in fact it's become an information science with patients. So I think we need to just flip the paradigm and say, how do we, how do I become a better um, data savvy person with even just basic knowledge and, and move the agenda forward? Yes. Hi, I'm Matt Gerlach, Chief Operating Officer at Chalk Children's. You know, as we talk, as I'm, I'm listening to you, and I think one of the key themes that we keep hearing is how do we integrate the data? How do we have all these take data from multiple different data sources? And I think we continue to see different tools explode. I think daily I'm getting emails from companies that have a new software solution for XYZ. And so instead of trying to really aggregate and come back to common platforms, we're really seeing more and more individualized uh, software solutions being being driven. And it seems that the, the focus really should be on more integration, designing the kind of platforms necessary to ensure that that data flows, but also perhaps setting standards around uh, different software solutions so that we don't end up with multiple diverse different um, different folks. Is, is, is there legislation necessary? Is yes. that, are there standards? What do yes. we need to do to, to, to solve that problem? Oh, so I'm a little bit, uh, I'm probably a little harsh on this because it's good. You know, I mean, in healthcare, we're a capitalist or, you know, country and we have a lot of entrepreneurs that that potentially like to leverage data, like to leverage those things for their own business model, which is fine. That's okay. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be, but we do need legislation that does create a freedom of, you know, of information that continues and that you should share. The patient should be able to get their data. You should not have one EMR company say, no, I'm not going to share my data with another EMR, EM, EMR company because they're a different company. But what's happening right now was really very good. The fact that right now with the cloud and the internet of things, you will be able to actually connect this much easier than the old days where it used to be an install. And, uh, but we do need legislation. We, we, and, and it's, it's out there. We just got to get it from a lot of congressmen are there, you know, Bill Hur, who's leaving, is you know has led a lot of this. It's going to the Senate, hopefully, and hopefully it'll be. But you know, there's organizations out there that have economic issues, are 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 planning to block it. I think the voice of the patients and the families will get very loud this decade because I think we're coming yeah. to the crossroads of not being able to do what we can do uh, without dealing and confronting with data ownership issues. I think the the voice of the patient is going to get very, very loud this decade. And I think since we work at a children's hospital, it wouldn't be wonderful to have precision medicine not just collating data, but throughout someone's lifetime. Because I think that's the XYZ axis of this big gain is, 
you know, lack of fragmentation, but also continuum can be built in. I'll, I'll provide uh, a different lens, right? I'll put my CIO hat back on for a second. As, as a person who deals with the challenge of all these different point solutions, trying to manage the type 2 diabetes patients, the CHF patients, um, you know, CIOs get uh, beat over the head because cost and complexity go hand in hand, right? And so every one of these is another thing to buy, another license, another maintenance contract, another integration point, another skill set that you have to train the organization for, another change management, uh, you know, workflow change. And so to really the thing is, is to scan the environment for, you know, for some of these tools, but also think plat platform thinking versus, you know, point solution thinking. And I'll give you an example. So we, we work together as UC Health when the five UCs come together. And so actually, believe it or not, UCLA and UCSF might do things together. It's an amazing concept. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, our robotic process automation is a place where we kind of stepped in as CIOs and said, look, everyone's kind of moving down this path. Let's do a single RFP, choose a single or a very small number of platform vendors because the number of use cases where robotic process automation will give us you know, either reduction of waste, uh, you know, a, a reduction in cost, a improved throughput time, it's going to be endless. Every site is going to come up with three or four initial things they want to do, that's 15. But we're investing into one technology platform, one skill set to train the organization on and use it 20 or 30 different times. That's why your, your CIO, your CMIO, your CNIO need to be in the room kind of connecting that conversation to what doctors want to do to improve care. I'll just add, there are lots of companies, there are startups, there are tiny startups that do, you know, uh, uh, assimilate codes and see who's high risk to be hospitalized again. They do allow for data integration and, and exchange. We use them, so they're there. But they're tiny little startups, and so if you don't hear about them from word of mouth, they will go ignored, and if they go ignored, they go unfunded, and if they go unfunded, they close, right? So it's also really important if you do work at a big hospital system or you do work at a big insurance plan that you have the kind of engineering team that in themselves is they're visionaries as well and they actually want to solve these problems. You know, we work with payers where every Saturday the eligibility is down. Like that's the conversation, you know? So I think what you you ask is very important, but I'm also embarrassed to tell you, you know, it's it's crazy when that's the problem that's still not solved, right? Um, so I, I will say though, there are there are many companies that, you know, we launch markets based on what you're at, because we don't want to see patients without records. It's dangerous, you know? So they're, they're out there. So to Renee's point, one of the things I do want to add is uh, that's really important because let's, let's think about something that, uh, like self-driving cars. And you look at all the, uh, the self-driving cars that are emerging, there's not a single car company that is trying to do it on its own. With, uh, they're all partnering with startups. Somebody, yep. uh, I know a trucking company that's actually partnering yep. with 10 startups. So it's, I think, as much on sort of some of the more established yeah. organizations. One of the things we know from all of our research on this is scale matters. So it's the big companies that actually have the ability to invest, but also have the data to share. Uh, and I think it's incumbent to sort of partner on you to partner with some of these right. smaller organizations <coughs> to yeah. give in them the, a chance. In the because history of everything that works, there was a time when it didn't. Right? Yes. And so you, you know, I would say if you don't like the way something is, make sure you're working with the kind of people that want to help you change it. Yeah. I call that ecosystem thinking. Mm -hmm. yes. But I think also we have the problem of having this this North Star of yes. AI and potential for precision medicine across population. At the same time, we're mired in complexity of all of this and we have I think a lack of sense of urgency as well, because there's nothing that's going to really speed this up unless we all wanted to. And healthcare is one of those few industries which really needs to be integrated, right? I mean, you can argue that a, an automobile <laughs> manufacturing company, if they have their own vertical supply chain, life is good. Yes, does it affect us? Could we do it a little bit cheaper? Yes, but this is something where we all benefit from interconnection. And then, and and sort of the. Uh, what we call the legacy systems and the sort of the the complexity of the past infrastructure, like you know when we had the problems registering for, with with Obamacare uh, and the website crash. What nobody really talked about was it was the archaic systems that actually caused the failure, not not sort of the front end. Um, so I think there's a lot that it's a particularly thorny set of problems to crack in in, in healthcare just because of the way this industry has grown up. Uh, yes, there. 
Good morning, uh, Larry Wellickson from the Society of Hospital Medicine. So, uh, Anthony, you mentioned a key point is that we're moving, we're changing what being a doctor is. It's it's a data analytic kind of thing. We're sitting here in a medical school, and so I just want to ask, how much is the Department of Tr Digital Transformation in connection with the medical school? And how much have we changed the people that we are selecting to come into medical school? I mean, the idea that, that my analytic of data was you came to me today, I measured your blood pressure, I made a decision that was gonna last for six months, you know, but am, are the medical students today, if they're presented with your last six months of blood pressures, trained to make an informed decision? Or is it going to be the very frightening slide you showed of cut here, take this out? I mean, is it going to be where the doctor gets a printout, somebody's already analyzed the data, and that unsophisticated person? My, my bias is that we haven't done a better job of selecting the right people for medical school, the right people for nursing school, to enter into a world where they're going to need to assemble and analyze data. Uh, and so I just want to get a sense, can you, I'd be happy if you told me at UCI you'd figure it out, because I travel all around the country, yep. and they're educating medical students almost exactly the way I was educated in the 60s. No, it's, that's definitely true. I had as a few of you know, I had the privilege of speaking in front of 200 medical school deans last April, March at the AAMC, and I was truly expecting a fairly sizable pushback to totally radically change the medical school curriculum to include not just data science, but also entrepreneurship and innovation, and there was virtually no pushback. Um, and I think that was a really a high, one of the highlights of my year last year, realizing um, the medical school deans realized that this has to change. And I opened the, my talk with saying that the Flexon report's been around 100 years and nothing's really changed dramatically in medicine, as, as you pointed out. So I think um, they're ready for change. I think we all need to push the agenda to change. I, I work with the AMA also, and they're anxious to have clinicians embrace this area because I think this is the real deal. This is our once-in-a-generation opportunity to really change the trajectory of medicine and it's, um, the, the good news is that it's actually ahead of schedule. AI is about 10 to 15 years ahead of schedule. So we kind of are pleasantly surprised at the, at the progress. At the same time, shame on us if we don't make something of it, so. Um, I'll speak uh, for UCI. So Dr. Goldstein tomorrow, uh, yesterday morning kicked off talking about the College of Health Sciences, how we're getting an opportunity to reinvent the future uh, around medicine, including education an established school of medicine, a new school of nursing, uh, you know, a, an emerging school of uh, public and population health, <laughs> pharmacological uh, sciences. And so, you know, we're, we feel like we have an opportunity here with that kind of infusion, you know, through, through our donors to kind of rebuild the model. It's not a blank sheet of paper, but it's a chance to radically rewrite the script combined with being a university with a separate school of information and computer sciences Getting people to work together is a challenge at times, but we, you know, we're working hard at that in roles like mine where we're bringing together the medical world, the healthcare world, and, and the data science world. We're really pushing uh, hard at that. But I always also come back to this, and this was a conversation I had with our chancellor at UCSF, uh, Sam Hoggood. And, and he, he was talking about hard, how hard it is to, one, change a curriculum, because you got to get it through all of the existing faculty, and you have some of the you know, old school thinkers there. And then even when you get the change in the curriculum, you know, a student that you're interviewing to start next year's class, think about when they actually start practicing medicine, right? It's a full decade at least before they, they, they get out there. And so it is just a long cycle to get really the critical mass of, right. of people out there to change things. I, but going back to my point, I think we need to change the rate of change. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's one medical school now in Ch near Chicago that's graduating 50 medical students every year, and they have to pick up a master's in computer science, engineering, or data science. So I, I think your point's well taken that we don't want the data science and engineering to change the nature of medicine. If anything, I think it will rehumanize medicine by having much better, much better, better data science, because they'll 
liberate us from a lot of the burden that's unnecessary right now. I'd like to echo that point because you talked about maybe we don't admit the right, we need to look for different criteria. What I would tweak that to say is we really need to infuse all of our medical students with computational thinking. Uh, because you have to understand sort of how these technologies work, how AI in particular works. I have I do some work with a software industry organization, and they talk about every job being a, a software job. And I said, that doesn't sound right to me, even though I advocate this stuff all day long. And they said, well, uh, ev everybody's either a coder or a clicker. So coder is, is, is obvious. But every, all of us are clickers. And, you know, so when you click, it seems like a trivial thing to do. But if you you have to understand sort of the, the architecture of these systems to understand how they work. Uh, when they're right, when they're wrong, and sort of there's a logic to it that is now an essential skill for better and for worse. Uh, so I think we need to it sort of plays on Dr. Chang's point, which is we really need to educate people on data science, on computational thinking, things like that, that are not yet in most medical school curricula. Well, I assume this is. team players for medical school, so you can't expect to get a team. And if you don't bring in people, so, so you, do need, you do need to really rethink. I think it's great that you're aggregating the schools, because, but you really need to really think who are teaching the people of the future. You're right. There is a 10-year lag time, but guess what? If you start two years from now, it's 12 years. Yep. And, and I don't think what – I'm glad to hear you heard that from AAMC, but I'm not hearing the imperative in business – if the CEO is failing, the company fails or out of business. Yep. Look at what gets a dean promoted. Look at what gets the faculty promoted. It's not adoption of AI. It's not being cutting edge. So it's a real challenge. I will say I, I assume this is why Kaiser is opening a medical school, right? They want to teach the Kaiser way. Um, but I will also say, and as a doctor, and I don't know how the other doctors on, in the room or on the panel feel, I'm worried about our profession right? We are, um, we are st maybe stuck on the wrong problem. And I hire doctors for a living. I'll tell you that the vast majority of the doctors I hire, they know how to work a smartphone, but they've lost sight of the importance of actually looking a patient in the eye, <laughs> right? Um, and we are now losing our jobs as doctors to nurse practitioners. And maybe that's because a nurse practitioner can focus on 10% of a problem and use, be trained to use the software, whereas we are boiling the ocean in four years of school and, you know, I, I forgot how many years of training I did, right? So I, I think that's also kind of the, the problem too. You know, one of the big discussions that I actually don't want you guys to leave the room without, uh, which is very, very prevalent in AI cir circles, is called humans in the loop. Uh, and, you know, so the, the discussion is about what's the role of humans. And I think Renee raises a really good point about this because, uh, and, you know, I, we were also asked the question, will there be more physicians or less? The, sort of the role of judgment in an automated world uh, is goes up substantially, the value of judgment uh, and being able, because as I think Dr. Chang pointed out, there's there's all of these specialized AI systems, but the patient is a whole. And so I think the role of judgment becomes extremely important in, in an automated, uh, in a world driven by automated systems. There, There is a sense that 85% of the time, 85% of the patients will be okay, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, when my daughter was hospitalized last week at UCLA, it was disastrous. You know, I ended up having to practice medicine on my own kid, which I... I can't stand, but there's this general sense that this kid probably will, you know, be okay. 15% of the time, this concept of having the automation, having the, um, the AI and the machine learning is going to save us, you know? And so uh, to the physician's point, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. We, we all better be open to it, but I just wonder if it's going to take four years of medical school and seven years of residency and training to get us to be that right fit. That's, I think. We have time for one last question. But I also just want to say we need to revamp medical education and training with smart use of technology as well. I mean, we've been stuck training and educating the same way for the last few decades. So I was just curious, in light of seeing everybody on uh, public Wi-Fi, you know, what are we doing to address cybersecurity uh, with data as well as with medical devices. So somebody who manages technology, that is for you. <laughs> uh, 
uh, well, yeah, this is going. This is going to be a, a topic that will never get off the agenda. Um, you know what I would say, and you know my my exposure is watching what what uh, our uh, our organization does, uh, and, and and we do a lot. I mean, there there's a lot of focus on it in terms of um, you know how we try to make awareness in the organization, top to bottom. Uh, every individual understand that they create a point of risk for the organization. Uh, and of course, every day as we come up with a new piece of technology and a new way to interface, the doctors to interface uh, you know, with tools or the patient to be able to interface, we create new risk points. A lot of talk right now around uh, medical device exposure and, and, and what does that, um, you know, what kind of exposure does that really create? In addition to kind of understanding the risks, I actually talked to the cybersecurity experts around the world who are talking about how much how likely are the perpetrators out there willing to exploit that and potentially do harm to a patient? Uh, you know, it, it's a topic that uh, no CEO wants to hear about because all they see or all they think about is cost, cost, cost while they're trying to manage a very complex business uh, situation. Um, all I can tell you is that we do the best we can with the resources that we can really justify. Uh, we'll always uh, have an element of risk that we feel like we're not prepared for, but, you know, we, we'll just keep battling the battle. I'm going to say one last thing because uh, as a digital evangelist most of the time, the one thing I will tell you is paper outperforms technology when it comes to privacy. Uh, <laughs> very, very easily, right? Uh, but you look, you give up all the other benefits. There's, there's no, uh, I mean, you just look at every day you read in the newspaper what's going on about sort of who was, who was hacked, who was breached, uh, and, and it just never stops. Uh, as long as there's a financial incentive and these hackers are getting really, really smart. It is actually uh, the, the scary side of digital transformation and it's something that we need to put a lot of resources in. Uh, we actually do need plug and play solutions for things like cybersecurity, though the, it's, it's never going to be, the battle's never going to be completely won, but I think it's very, very critical that we address it. I want to add one more statement. This is, so we've run several task force around uh, you know, data privacy, data use within the University of California, and I'll pair it something one of our you know, top faculties on the topic said. It's one of the things is we have experts in every topic you can think of, data privacy, ethics, et cetera, and we've brought them all to the table to work on these task force. And uh, her profound statement was, you can't have good privacy without good security. And I have used that statement in so many different scenarios where people try to um, push down the importance of security and what's the real risk and saying, it's not just about security and, and ending up with some type of breach. We're actually putting our patient's privacy or our student's privacy at risk by not focusing appropriately on security. So um, I, I know we have to leave and I actually have a... <laughs> I have to be in the airport like within 15 minutes, but uh, <laughs> which is uh, is always my style of being late. But you know, for our organization or for a lot of organization, I think I think data privacy and security. There's a lot of strong tools you could get auditors that come in and look at your processes. Uh, you sometimes have to take very draconian uh, steps. Like for us, anyone who accesses any type of uh, sensitive information, they cannot ever send uh, anything outside and their USBs are completely disabled. So you do, there's a lot of things that you can do. And then we bring in these very high tech uh, folks that kind of try to penetrate us, penetrate our data. And we're constantly having, we have a whole entire team that is going all over the place trying to make sure that they could get in. So we, we look at the processes on an annual basis. There's a lot of good certification out there. I, I'm, I know we hear a lot of breaches, but it seems like under medical privacy and security, it's, it's been a little less than you know, the other retailers that are out there. But it does take an effort. Can I and, just um, end this on a good note? Because... Um, I think despite the relatively low morale and the very, very huge challenges ahead, more young people applied to medical schools last year than ever before. Mm -hmm. So we need to have a sense of urgency to leave a really, really good platform for them. So I'm going to top your more positive note because, you know, my son is applying. Can you help him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get right down to brass tacks here, shall we? Uh,